Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 22. Excited to share God's word with you. What a great crowd on the third week of August. You know, school starts back shortly, doesn't it? And all the students are super excited about, I'm not even going to say what I was about to say because that would have been nice. You're just super excited about going to school. We got, can I just catch up on a few announcements before we get into God's word? We have Grow Track this afternoon. If you're new to the church, I would love to meet you, connect with you. Uh, right after the third service, so at 12.30 in the office building, we'll feed you lunch. You can go home, get a cup of coffee, come back. We'll feed you lunch, take care of your kids. Take about an hour just to talk to you about where we've been, where we're going, uh, and try to answer any of your questions about the church. It's our partnership class. It's how you take your next step to get connected to the church. So that's uh, every first and third is with me every second and fourth. It's a two-part class is with one of our leadership. And that just helps you get connected through a, through, a, through a Sunday morning service team. So we'd love to start the journey today if you're able. Also, didn't Demetric, if you were here last week, didn't Demetric do a great job? He started in the Bridge Church. And uh, I just wanted to thank you again publicly for your generosity. We were able to give him $25,000 for that ministry. And, and so uh, we, our footprint is expanding. Uh, we have a, a church planning intern coming at the end of September. He's moving his family down here. He'll be a part of us for about 18 months. We'll teach him what we know. We'll get him around great people like you. He'll try to catch the culture of what's going on. We'll help him develop a core team. We'll help him find a place to plant. And then we're gonna plant, in, in about a year and a half, we're gonna plant our fourth church somewhere to, for, the, for the glory of God. So uh, he's, a, he's a young guy. I'm super excited about it. Tons of potential. He's been in youth ministry for about six years. And so, again, we're not just trying to build our kingdom, we're trying to build the kingdom. And then one more, one more thing that I think is super exciting, our, our school will open up, Cloverhill Christian Academy, in the next couple of weeks. 300 plus kids, 12 months to first grade. And, uh, and, and we're bringing in another modular, not like the modulars we have in the back, but this is a modular that has six classrooms, office space, a resource room, and bathrooms to be able to expand our growth, to take some of the pressure off of this building. And our goal is to add a grade a year to keep expanding and growing and so on. And we, we really have a desire to touch the next generation, to prepare, prepare them uh, today so they can touch their world tomorrow. We, we want to help them realize the truth from a lie. And how many know there's a lot of lying going on in the world today when it comes to spiritual things? We want them to know the fake between the phony and the real. There's a lot of stuff saying, hey, do this and you'll be fat, satisfied. Do this and you'll be fulfilled. We know you're not fulfilled until you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We want to help these kids. We want to point them in the right direction, start them on a firm foundation and give them everything they need to fulfill their God-given destiny. So be praying with us about that. Just some super exciting times in the life of our church. And then one more, and then we're going to get into the word. Next week is young, young, uh, young people, commu uh, young communicators. We're going to have, we're going to have five young people I mean, like all under the age probably of 21 that are going to share from God's word. They're going to share our values. And they're, that's like a little big golf clap. You're like, oh, no, no, no. That's our future. That's, that's the church of today and tomorrow. And, and uh, I, 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 we, can't, we cannot get our eyes off of the next generation. We've got to We've got to push them forward. We, we got, you know, my kid, we're going to get into the word, but my kids used to love to swing. And I would, you, you do, you have, you heard of an underdog? Did anybody ever do that? I'm the only one where you'd get behind them and you'd run, run and push them. And then you'd go on. That's what our kids need today. They need some older people that'll be their underdog and come understand and just launch them into the, into the possibilities that God has for them. I want to be that person. I want you to be that person and God. God's going to help us. Well, stand with me for the reading of God's word. We're going to read again. And did I tell you where? Matthew chapter 22. It'll also be on the screen. I think this morning's message is one of the one of as important messages I've ever preached. We're in between series, and so this is a standalone, and I've just entitled it, just again, I'm so creative. The greatest commandment. I'm, I know I wow you with my creativity and my 
that's me. But when the Pharisees, verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply. So, so they're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to get him to say something to use as evidence against him. They're really not interested in him answering the question. They're more interested in catching him in, in something that they could use to convict him at a later time. And he's already shown his wisdom to the Sadducees and now it's the Pharisees' turn. And so they come at him and they, they ask him this question. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is where my creativity kicked in and I titled this message. This is the first and greatest commandment. Father, we thank you for your word today, and, and I pray we wouldn't rush over it, we wouldn't hurry through it. Lord, we've come today to worship you, but to also to hear from you. And so I say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Speak through me, your servant, God, and touch the hearts and the lives of the people who have chose to come today and who are watching online. I pray your blessing on your word and your anointing upon it. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. This will be a great week for taking notes. I know if you're saved, you take notes anyways, but it, it, this would be a great week for taking notes. But Jesus not only gives us the greatest commandment, but he also gives us the equation to, to live out the greatest commandment. So he just didn't say love God, but he put some, he put some other things to it. He said love God with all your heart. So I wanna talk about how do you love God with your heart? He said, love him with your mind. How do you love God with your mind? How, how do you love God with your soul? And it's not one of the three, it's all three of the three. Like you only will fulfill that commandment when you are loving him with your whole being, with your heart, soul, and mind. So to love God with your mind requires knowledge. It requires that you have a proper understanding of who God is and what he's about. And, and I, I just, I want to just stay here for just a minute because some people have the wrong picture or the idea of God. Therefore, they cannot love God properly. If you don't know who God is and what's God about, some people see God, their relationship with God as a wall that there's a barrier, that there's an obstacle, that they're on one side, that God is on the other side, that they could never cross that barrier, that they could never get close to God, that God doesn't want a personal relationship with them because of who they are. And that is so contrary to, to the God that we serve. And we find that out in scripture. I mean, God always took the initiative. When Adam and Eve sinned, they went into hiding. They created the barrier. They they. They covered up their bodies. They, they were hiding behind the bush. And here comes God from heaven, initiating, seeking, looking, not just tearing down the wall, but breaking through the wall. Adam, Eve, where are you? God is always, he's always wanting relationship with his prized creation. He always, he's always seeking, searching, longing, initiating relationship with you. That, that's why when even sin disrupted the relationship, the Bible says in the New Testament, for God so loved the world, World, that he gave his only, one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus did not come to the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to tell you how bad you were, but through him you might be saved. That, that's illustrated in the life of that lady that was caught in adultery. You remember they drug her out? She'd been caught in the very act, and, and they threw her at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus didn't, didn't wail on her and tell her how bad she was and rebuke her. He, no, he looked at everybody else and said, he was without sin, cast the first stone. And they were wise enough to know that they had sinned. So from the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their stones and began to walk away. And then Jesus looked down at that girl and said, baby, where, where's your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus is constantly trying to remove the barrier, bust through the barrier, come through the barrier. That's why Jesus, when he died on the cross, the Bible says that the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom. The, the curtain was the separation from, from God to people. And there was only one person that could go in there and that was the priest and he could only go in there at certain times. And Jesus was declaring by his death and resurrection, man, I'm tearing that barrier down. You don't have a high priest now who's unable to sympathize with you, but you have one who's been tempted in every way just like you are, but was without sin. Therefore, we can come 
boldly to the throne room of a gracious God. There's not a wall, it's been removed. There there we will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us in our time of need. To to love God with your mind, you gotta understand God. He's not a wall. Some people think that your relationship with God is like a stairway that you've got to strive and discipline, that you've got to work your way to God, that you've got to be good enough, that you've got to do enough, that you've got to say the right things, act the right way. And, and that is so contrary to the word of God. We, we are not saved by our works. That's why the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It's not a stairway to heaven. I don't care who sang that song or how much you like it. There is not a stairway to heaven. Jesus walked down the stairs so we don't have to walk up them. Jesus made a way when there was no way. He, he's all a, some people think that their relationship with God is like a garbage dump where they stink and they smell and they've gotta get cleaned up and then they can go to God. You don't get cleaned up and go to God. You go to God and he cleans you up. Here, when when the Pharisees were questioning Jesus and trying to trick him again, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those that think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. You know what the right picture of God is or the right relationship with God is? It's, it's it's it's, It's a door. And Jesus is knocking on that door. It's the door of your heart. And, he, and he's always initiating and he's always coming forward. He took the first 99 steps. All you gotta do is open the door. He wants relationships. He wants closeness. He wants fellowship. In fact, he stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. And if you hear his voice and open the door, he'll come in. You don't, you don't have to drag him. He doesn't beat down the door. He doesn't kick down the door. He knocks on the door. But if you'll open it, he'll gladly come in. Well, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. He'll gladly come in. And he'll share a meal together with you as a friend. See, see to, to, to really love God with your mind, you've got to know, you've got to know God. When my understanding and knowledge, a proper knowledge of God increases, my love increases. That's why it's so important. I can't tell you enough or, or often enough. You've got to be people in God's word. You, you got to spend time uh, uh, thinking on it. You got to find time you gotta, you got to find a place. you got to come up with a plan to consistently feed yourself on God's word. Because when your knowledge, of God's grow, uh, your knowledge of God grows, your love for God increase, a uh, proper knowledge and understanding. I'm reading through the gospels right now. That's my plan. I change it up so it doesn't get stale. I, I, I get, if I just do the same thing all the time, it can just become a habit, whatever. And I don't like, some of you like that. I'm reading three chapters a day. I find one, cha- one verse in those three chapters that really make a difference. But as I read through those gospels, I'm learning how Jesus interacted with people. I'm learning, I'm learning how he responded to people. I'm reading again his miracles, his words, his instructions. I'm, I'm learning what he expects of me as one of his followers. I'm getting a better understanding of his character and his nature. I'm realizing once again that he hates pious, self-righteous, I'm better than you, I can make it on, on, on my own type of attitudes. And he loves people that are honest and humble and are authentic and genuine and real and desperate to know the truth and walk in the truth. I've read again four times now because it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what he did for me on the cross, the sin that he bore on my behalf and the resurrection on the third day. And the more I know about Jesus, the more I appreciate and love Jesus. To love God with your mind, you don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to have a doctorate in ministry. You have to have a passion for God's word. You've got to you got to accept his word as authority. You've got to, we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, Paul's writing the third church at Thessalonica. When I, when I preached God's word to you, you accepted it. That's important that when you read the word of God, when you hear the word of God, you accept it, not as the word of men, but actually as it is the word of God, which is in work in you to those who believe. To, to accept God's word, you gotta believe and, and it's gotta become your authority. Like you gotta, it's gotta be your standard for life. 
It's got to be the compass in which you set your direction, the counsel for making wise decisions, the benchmark that you use for, for evaluating everything. The Bible has to have the first and the last word in your life. Your attitude towards it determines your acceptance of it. If it's just another book, then you'll treat it as another book. But if it's the word of God, if it's the inerrant, infallible, perfect word of God, then you'll live it, then you'll live according to it. You'll follow it when you don't understand it. You'll follow it even when you don't like it. You gotta, you gotta be reminded today, and we gotta continually be reminded that God's word has the power to generate life and create faith and produce change and beat back the devil. Has the power to cause miracles and heal hurt and build character and transform circumstances. God's word has the ability to impart joy and overcome adversity and defeat temptation and infuse hope, to release power and to cleanse your mind, to bring things into being and guarantee our future forever. You've got to accept it. You've got to assimilate it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Meditate on it. Listen to it. Read it. Study it. Talk about it. And you've got to act on it. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. The mind requires proper knowledge to love God. And we grow in faith when we grow in our understanding of God's word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. To love God with your mind, you gotta have a proper understanding of God. And that comes by spending time in his word and, 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 and spending time in like what you're doing today and listening to God's word. Here's another thing. If you're gonna love God, the heart requires intimacy. He didn't just say love God with your mind. He said love him with your heart and your soul as well. You need more than information to love God. You need more than a proper understanding to know God. Spiritual in intimacy does not just, know, does not just come from knowing about God. It comes from experiencing God. With your mind, you know God. And with your heart, you worship God. This is good, really good. You, you, it's not one or the other, it's all three. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come back to this, but you remember the 10 lepers and, and they were healed of their leprosy. Let's read about it. As he was going into a village, Jesus was 10 men who had leprosy met him. Leprosy was a death sentence. In every sense of the word, it was autoimmune deficiency where your flesh would eat your flesh. And they were dying, yes, physically, but they were also dying spiritually because they had no access. They were quarantined. They were kicked out of the city. Relationally, they were cut off from their family. Lepers lived with lepers. They, had no, they couldn't go to their kid's ball game. They couldn't kiss their wife goodnight. They didn't have what we have today. They were ostracized. They were isolated. They were alone. They, they, were, they were social outcasts. The Bible even says that lepers, you were by law able to, to stone them, to kick them out of this city. They were the lowest of the low. And Jesus comes along and they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, I want to pause right there and, and just uh, expand on this for a minute. They had to do something. They had to respond. Why do we call people to the front every week? Couldn't you just get healed where you are? Absolutely. But there's something about taking a step. There's something about moving. It's a response to the good. It, it builds faith. When they stood up, when they stepped out, before they even got to the priest, they were healed. It wasn't a matter of getting to the priest. Jesus was able to do it all by himself. It was a response to his call. See, you could, when Peter wanted to, he had to get it, he had to take a step out of the boat. When Moses saw the burning bush, he had to step towards it. There's something about when you make movement, just a little bit of movement to God, God responds in a miraculous and a powerful way. 
I, I, I'm concerned about some of you who just think, God, touch me. Just touch me how you can. I don't need to do it. No, no, no. It's a response to his call. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Take a step towards me because my burden is light and my yoke is easy. I will give you rest. I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, there's always a response to the call of God. And when you respond, God oftentimes Oftentimes, God blows your mind and does above and beyond what you could ever ask, think, or imagine. They responded to God's command, and they went, and they were cleansed. And when one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. And he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. I want to ask you, is that an appropriate response? If you were healed of leprosy, if you were healed of this disease that was causing you so much pain and ostracization and, and so much ridicule, so much hurt in every area of your life. It, is, it, is it appropriate to go back to the person who healed you and give them praise and adoration in a loud voice even to the point where you get on your face before them and you give them praise and thanksgiving? Do, do you realize that before Christ, we were spiritual lepers. We didn't have a flesh-eating disease, but we were dying. We were separated from God. We were without hope in this world. We were headed to a devil's hell, but by God's grace, he made a way. And if you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior, if you have committed to following him and, and to walking in his ways, then, then this is what Ephesians says, that you have crossed the longest distance in the world by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been accepted and forgiven. And you are being transformed. You have been healed of spiritual leprosy and have a new life and a new hope and a new heart. You have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You have the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide you and comfort you and teach you. You have been blessed with everything you need for life and godliness. If you remain in him, you will bear much fruit and spend eternity in heaven. Is it appropriate for you to express your love to God in a way that he has requested? Is it appropriate to, for you to praise him with a loud voice and to bow to him in worship? Think about this leper 30 years. 30 years has gone by. He has a job, he's financially stable, he's watched his kids' graduation, he's given his daughter away in marriage, he's held his grandkids, he's got friends that love him, he's got a church that he's connected to. Physically, he has no more pain. Leprosy is a distant mem memory. If he were to encounter Jesus, would it still be appropriate for him to praise him in a loud voice and fall on his knees and worship him? Listen, some of us have been saved for a long time and we've come casual and callous and what Christ did for us many years ago has become old and stale. We've, we've lost our first love. It's become routine and matter of fact and a distant memory and we've quit expressing our love and appreciation. So what did, the, what did they do? And, and he was a Samaritan guy and Jesus asked, we're not all 10 clans, where were the other nine? Has no one returned? to give praise to God except this one? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. He returned to God to give him praise. I, I wanna, if you're gonna love God with your heart, you gotta commit to a life of worship that expresses your love, reveals your gratitude, and intentionally keeps you in proper perspective and right relationship with God. That, that's why the psalmist says, hey, you wanna love God with your heart? Come into his presence with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You know what it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. I bless your holy name. I'm not gonna forget any of your benefits. You've, you've, you've forgiven my sins. You've healed my disease. Jesus, you renewed my mind. You give me strength. You've redeemed me from the pit. You've crowned me with love and, and, and confidence. For the mind, for you, to love, for you to love God with your mind, the knowledge of God has to increase. 
The heart needs intimacy, worship to grow. Here's another thing, the soul requires obedience. If you're gonna love God with your soul, you've gotta obey God. Here, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. You know what the psalmist said, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. This is what I want you to know, everybody's gonna have a shepherd, you're gonna have a leader, you're gonna have a king, you're gonna have a final authority. David said, God, you're gonna be my shepherd. And then he said, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Our shepherd is gonna make us do things. Well, you say, that's a problem. Nobody's gonna make me do something. Well, you're gonna have to pick another shepherd because the shepherd that we serve is gonna require you do something. Why would I want a God who makes me do something? Because the God who's asking permission to lead your life has scars in his wrists and in his feet. He died sacrificially for you. He knows what's best for you and he wants to lead you beside quiet waters. The person that loves Jesus will desire to consistently follow Jesus teaching on money and on marriage and on family and on values and on sexuality and on work and on relationships in everything. And we can be sure that we know if we obey his commandments, let me read that again. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and the truth is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. Jesus asked, was asked by the Pharisees, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus responded, love the Lord with all your heart. It's intimacy, it's worship. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, people were waving palm branches and they were throwing out uh, things in front of him to walk on. And, and you know what the Pharisees said? They said, Jesus, tell your followers to shut up, to quit praising you like that. And he responded and said, if they don't praise me, the rocks are gonna cry out. They'll praise me, they'll bless me. He said, I want you to love me with all your soul. It's obedience. Here's what Jesus said. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? I, I've, been, I've been hearing some of you call me Lord, but you don't wanna honor what I'm asking and telling you to do. It was like he was surprised that they had a confession of faith, but they weren't backing it with their lives. It didn't make sense to him. How can you call me Lord? Because what is Lord? It's leader, it's authority. How can you call me Lord with your mouth and not submit and surrender to me in your walk? He said, love me with all your mind, knowledge, proper understanding. They that know the Lord will be strong and carry out great exploits. Well, listen, what if, what if I just love God with my heart? with my emotions, with my praise, with my affection, with my gratitude, but not with my obedience and not with biblical knowledge. You know what that is? That's emotionalism. That's just, let me jump and shout, but when I, my feet hit the ground, who cares where I'm going or what, what's happening in my life? That's the person that goes from church to church looking for a goose bump, looking for another feeling, looking for another something to feel. It's emotional, you're chasing emotion. We don't live by feelings, we live by faith. You, you, don't, you don't wanna, you don't wanna live, you don't wanna just got, love God out of emotions. They don't, they don't last. Well, well, what if I love God with my mind, biblical knowledge, but without my heart, without worship, spiritual intimacy, and, and without my soul obedience? What is that? That's intellectualism. That, that's, that's knowledge puffs up. How many know people that can quote scripture and, and chapter and verse, they can debate doctrine. They know what a Nephilite is, but they don't live a surrendered life. The Pharisees were the most intellectual people spiritually in Jesus' day, but they were, most, they were the most bankrupt spiritually. What if I love God with my soul, that I obey him, but not with my mind or not with my heart? What is that? That's legalism. 
just keep the rules, just toe the line, not out of delight, but out of discipline. That's not a, that's not a relationship, that's dead, dry religion. Here's what Jesus said, hey, he, you want one commandment, you wanna stick to one commandment, you wanna make everything else easy, hey, just love me, but there's a way to love me. Love me with, my, with your mind. It's, it's, it's a proper understanding of God that he's gracious and good and generous, that he desires to bless and to fulfill and satisfy, that he wants to equip and empower, to protect, to provide and free all those who call him Lord. Love him with your heart. Give him the praise and the act. It, it is acceptable unto him. It is appropriate unto him that we declare, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together and love him with your soul. It's obedient, surrendered living. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who do, does the will of the Father who is in heaven here, I wrote this out, I hope this helps. When you know the God of the Bible, when you're loving him with your mind, you'll respond with praise and worship. It'll, re, it'll be a heart response and it will result with obedience and a surrendered life. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? To love God with all your heart with all your mind, biblical understanding, diving into scripture, and with all your soul. It's your walk, it's your obedience, and your commitment to him. My prayer is for you, my prayer is for me, that we'll love God with all our heart, all our mind, and all our soul. Amen, everybody. Stand with me, will you? I want you to ask yourself this question. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Search our hearts, God, and see what's in us. Are we loving you with our hearts? Are we loving you with our minds? Are we loving you with our souls? And if you're not, not I'm not, I don't want you to feel beat up. I want you to feel convicted and just ask the Lord to help you. And to begin to, to, to repent from that area where you're falling short. You know, sometimes we focus on one rather than the other. I've seen people that get so caught up in the knowledge of God that it just, it just comes, it's just arrogance and it just doesn't work. And then some people caught up in just the heart of God, you know, they get, they're just, they're just, they're just emotional. Wreck. I mean, it just doesn't work. And then people that just, ah, let me just, let me just stick to the law. Let me just obey the law. It's lifeless. It's dead. It's not one, it's all three. God, help us to love you with our minds. Give us a pro help us to have a proper understanding, to know you, God, to read your scripture. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd make the scripture come alive. Lord, you said the word of God is, 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 is active. And activate your word in our lives, Jesus. I pray that as we take a step and open up scripture, that you, would, that you would respond by illuminating it and making it real to us. Some of you need to make a commitment this morning to spend some time in God's word. On your way to work, listen to it. I don't know, redeem the time. You, 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 can, you can be creative, but just feed yourself with God's word. I don't, I don't wanna keep, we're gonna baptize a couple people, but I think this is so important. Some of you have grown just dry in your worship, like worship's for everybody else. It's not for me, I don't need it. It's not for you, it's for Jesus. And if you love Jesus, you're gonna, you're gonna express your devotion to Jesus. You're gonna be vocal in your, in your love for Jesus. You know what worship is? It's love expressed. You're gonna express a heart. And then obedience, are you following it? And I don't mean perfection, but there's gotta be progress in your life or you're forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to that which is before. Is the desire of your heart to obey God's word and follow him in every area. You know, that's a, that's a heart that God responds to. That's loving God. That, that, I mean, you'll benefit. Lord, I thank you that you've given us an equation. And, and when we do, uh, you just respond and you're gracious and good and kind in every way. And, and uh, Lord, we, we, we thank you for your word this morning and we just pray that it won't, 
that it won't go in one ear and out the other, but this week we'll grapple with it and we'll wrestle with it and we'll be reminded of it and that it'll continue to change us throughout this week and the weeks to come. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen.